As Lisa said, out of the mouths of babes, right? I think I maybe can just sit down. I think they said it all, didn't they? That was an amazing video, so thank you for sharing that. It was a, a great precur pre precursor to what I'm gonna talk about. First, I'd like to thank Lisa for, and her team, of course, who we've all seen already this morning, for inviting me to share some of my thoughts related to student voice and student ownership. When Lisa first called me, I have to start with a funny story, of course. People who know me, who knows me, you know I tell stories, right? So I have to start with a story, of course. Um, when Lisa called me and asked me to talk, speak today, I thought, sure, I can do that for a few minutes, leading, you know, kind of setting the stage for the keynote. And then I received a call from somebody from the center, probably Daryl, asking for a bio and a picture. And I thought, a bio and a picture, what? What are we doing here? So then I saw the final write-up in an email saying that I was going to be a keynote speaker. And I thought, OK, that's interesting. <laughs> and soon after, Lisa must have felt that, because she called me shortly after and said, and I said, so Lisa, what happened to me just sharing a few personal connections and interesting anecdotes in a few minutes? I didn't realize I would be a keynote speaker and have a picture in the bio and all that really cool stuff. And Lisa's response was, well, we had to call you something. Would you prefer a keynote, or would you just prefer we call you talker? And we had a good laugh about that. And before we ended, she reminded me, and I didn't bring my phone up here to time myself, but I'm pretty sure I'll stay within my limits, that I have 15 minutes. So if somebody wants to set a timer, please do. Give me a hand signal. All right, she's got it. So I better get started with my talk, right? So my goal for this morning is to share with you a, a few personal examples to get you thinking about student voice, which the students here did so well already. And I'd like to share a few of my personal connections with some real students in mind. You'll hear some amazing speakers, as Lisa's already told us today and tomorrow, who will share their real work in the classrooms every day on this topic. So how can I best help you remember student voice? And of course, it wouldn't be right for me to stand here as deputy superintendent and not talk about the framework for teaching, right? Does everybody want to go, oh, I'm running from the room now? But how are we applying the framework for teaching, specifically in areas domain one and three for your students, which is what you're going to be talking about these next two days? We all know the process. We all know it starts with the planning, preparation, your knowledge of your students, and what they know, understand, and what they're able to do. This precursor for domain is the precursor for domain two, the climate, the culture, which is kind of where I laid my hat as a teacher for many, many years. You know, what do you do for your environment that makes it conducive for learning? Setting up that strong, respectful classroom community that has a rich culture, and you have rich rapport with your students. And this leads us to domain three, the heart of the work of teaching. And instead of, Charlotte likes to call it, the minds on instead of the hands on. So the next two days, you'll be talking about the minds on work, the student voice, the student engagement, and the ownership pieces. So to help you be more minds on as a teacher, I'm always an educator first, I thought I'd give you an organizer. And I love the five W's. Who uses the five W's? The who, what, where, when, and why of student voice. So the who, we all know the who, right? All of our students are the who. All kids can learn, they will learn. And I know you believe that, or as our chancellor said, and our dean, you wouldn't be giving up two days out of your, your very, she said the middle of the summer, the beginning of the summer, right? Are they gone? Okay. It's the beginning, it's not the middle. So this, this it's, it's big for you guys to be here for two full days um, and, and really be invested in this learning. But you are also part of the who. If you don't do your part, then guess what? Student voice is not going to happen. The young ladies who talked about things being boring or I want to learn by exploring or I, you know, the teacher puts up a PowerPoint, and, but the teacher still made that part happen. Yes, yeah, she was able to do some research. They were able to pull out their own little nuggets, but the teacher set that part up for them. So you are a really important part of the who. So what? What is student voice? We've said it probably 20, 30 times already, but what is it? 
you all probably have your own idea of what student voice is. And as teachers, you have an idea of how you manifest it in your classroom. And our administrators here, they know what they're looking for, the evidence that they want to see when they walk into a classroom for a walkthrough or an evaluation when they're looking for student voice. Student voice can be an expression, a performance, creativity, anything that helps students really construct the teaching and the learning. It's when students have the opportunity to influence decisions. You heard a couple of the, the older students talk about that decision-making part. And you can see already, as high school students, how it's already shaping their lives and those of their peers around them, inside school and outside of school. And student voice begins and ends with the thoughts, the feelings, the visions, and the actions of the students themselves. Part of the framework for teaching, and, or what Charlotte would say, and I'm gonna call her Charlotte because I feel like we have this personal connection, <laughs> Charlotte and I. And if, if you've studied the framework as much as a lot of us have and read a lot of her work, I give you permission to also call her Charlotte. <laughs> so as Charlotte would say, the work of teaching includes creating a culture for learning and an atmosphere of excitement around learning. Students are engaged in meaningful and respectful tasks. That's Brian Lake's word, respectful tasks. In these classrooms, and hopefully your classroom, you don't have to spend a lot of your time trying to motivate students to take responsibility for their learning because you've organized it. You've presented the content, you've established the roles you're, that you encourage the students to assume, and your expectations are high, that students have the ability, and that they will take the, initi the initiative that motivates them to, to learn and excel. The next W, so we've talked about the who, the what, the where. This one is a no-brainer, right? The where is everywhere. The classroom, in the classroom, out of the classroom. We want students being motivated to express themselves in their homes. There are a lot of other places I could have put. Churches, their school neighborhoods, community groups, clubs, basically everywhere we go. We want them to have the skills that they need to be able to express themselves and share their ideas and their feelings. The when. When. That's basically your domain one. That's your planning. I really want to focus on the planning piece of it. So when. Have I planned my instruction to be student-centered and student-driven? Ask yourself that. Have you thought about the students' roles in their learning? What are they responsible for? How independent do they need to be? Have you established that and taught those independent routine, routines and the classroom management piece that goes with being an independent learner? How much do students have the ability to make decisions in your classroom? And that is, I'm so an elementary person. I see the high school group sitting here. I bonded with a few of them this year and I'm learning a lot about secondary, but this happens at kindergarten. Kindergartners can, can make decisions. They can be responsible for their learning. Having been a teacher for many years and an administrator for the last 10, I've had the wonderful opportunity to witness student voice in action. So I'll share a few of these experiences. So I have a few stories. Lisa asked me to make it really personal. And I've seen firsthand in my 22 years how transformative student voice has been for students, staff, and families. My last couple years at King, the fifth grade team, an amazing fifth grade team, took a very student-centered approach to their study of the Civil War. The students were encouraged to form their own questions about what they wanted to learn prior to any studying happening. What do you want to learn about the student Civil War? Some may have been questions that the teachers hadn't even thought about prior to beginning the unit. The students were encouraged in fifth grade, we saw some high schoolers talking about this, but these are fifth graders, to research, answer their questions, decide how they wanted to present the information to their peers. They set up this fabulous museum that everyone visited throughout the week, and students were allowed to express their voice through posters, songs, musical performances, dramatic representations, and through artifact displays. Great example of student voice, and, and basically student-driven. Which leads me to my next W, which is really not a W. I'm sneaking in an H here. How and how to. How do we honor student voice in our classroom? What does it look like? Students are provided opportunities to express themselves, sharing opinions. And I think the, we heard a lot of really great opinions in our video. One of my favorites, and I think he's a third grader, I know him, when he said, um, 
about how a lot of people read and they don't think while they're reading. And one of the things that I, as a second grade teacher, I don't know how many times I said, reading is thinking, reading is thinking. So when he said that, I wanted to say yay. But um, how are you doing that? How are you allowing the students to share opinions? The framework is very clear whoops, about the teacher's role in creating an environment productive for learning. Setting the agenda is our responsibility. It's your responsibility. However, it's very important that your classroom makes the shift from a learning, a learning environment managed by one person, you, the teacher, to an environment in which the students have some responsibility. For our newer teachers, I won't make you raise your hands, but for our newer teachers, our more inexperienced teachers kind of just getting their feet wet in all of this, it is a little frightening, isn't it? to allow students the opportunity to share responsibility for the classroom. Even the best of us vets, my, my, my kids call me, I'm saying I'm old school. How many of you have heard that? Well, here's the old school. So for us old school teachers, even as a classroom teacher, it was hard for me to, to release that, to give more responsibility to the students because you're, you're afraid they'll misbehave, be a little irresponsible when given too much freedom or too much choice, or worst of all, that they don't take advantage of the opportunity and, and choose not to do any work at all. We all know it happens, but I would encourage you to push through it. Keep working toward the classroom where students are taking these responsibilities for themselves. I'm reminded of a couple years ago when some student council members at King met me to improve lunch conditions of the food, basically what we were serving, how it was being prepared, even down to a few students who wanted hot sauce as a condiment in the lunchroom. And of course, they came to the principal because we, we have magical hats, we can do everything, right? The principal can fix it, change it, and make it all right. So what the, these are third, fourth, and fifth graders, they created surveys that they distributed around the school, they took home, gave it to their um, parents, teachers filled them out, all about the quality of the food. And my role was really to listen, support. Our food is really a vendor, and the food was, it was fine. It wasn't, it was nothing wrong with the food. It was just they wanted, you know, they wanted spaghetti, and they wanted, you know, special kinds of pizza, and just, we were having these really healthy, you know, multi-grain pizza, multi-grain chicken nuggets, and whole wheat bread. And they're like, wait a minute, what's up? You know, they weren't really happy with the changes. So anyway, they, they expected me to make it go back, put it back. We don't like that bread, we want the old white hot dog buns. <laughs> so I listened, I took their surveys to the first food service director, a vendor. Um, she listened, we worked together. We took their surveys to our wellness, our district wellness committee, of which I was a member, and we continued to work toward a better product that everyone could be happy with. And yes, we did put some hot sauce in the lunchroom. <laughs> so I think that made quite a few of them very happy. We had to take it out now, though, for the national school lunch, but th this was a couple years ago. A more recent example of student voice is, is from Urbana High School, and you saw some of these students in your video. So how many of you were here last year and saw the student voice group, Rachel Moyer's student social justice class. Great. Their teacher is presenting a um, session here today on some of the data from the social justice class at, US, at UHS along with a counterpart from Central. I think her name's Katie. And they're doing a great presentation. I would encourage you to attend the session. These students are amazing students. Um, we had the opportunity, Don and I, at the end of the year and several other district administrators to go to a um, poster session that they'd set up to share some of the, she talked about researching, some of the research that they had been working on all year, some of these social justice and equity issues. The students are really tackling things that when I was 16, 17, I didn't think about or really honestly care about. Um, dress code biases, again, school lunches, um, classmates who are hungry, you know, classmates who come to school and it's the only meal they have for the day. Um, what social messages are students receiving about who goes to college and who doesn't go to college? High school dropout rates. These were things that the students presented to us. The most important thing is that these students were given the opportunity to share their opinions. Their voices were heard by district administrators, their superintendent, their principal, assistant principals, teachers, friends, parents, board members. 
That was a great way to honor their voice and really let them be heard. And they got to share some wonderful opinions. Creating. So in Urbana, we have a wonderful fine arts program, which we love. Visual art, dance, drama, music. How many of you can think of a student who may not be a, a, a successful academic student? Behaviorally, they're not as successful. Socially, they're not the star of the room, right? But that kid may be a fantastic artist, fantastic musician. And we've heard why we, we have all the wonderful ways that we reach these kids. Linda's giving me the, I mean not Linda, uh, uh, Lisa's giving me the two minute sign, so I'm gonna hush, rush through a couple of these. Performing, I'm gonna skip that one. So the last why, last W is a why. Why do all this extra planning? Why do all the extra work? Because guess what? It is a lot of work and it isn't easy, but why do it? When students are asked for their opinion or invited to provide feedback on some aspect of their school or community, they get to act as the consultant. We as administrators and teachers should look to our students to inform decisions through more surveys, focus groups, just basic conversations. Talk to the kids, ask them what they want. The students may not exercise any real decision-making power. We, we know there's some things we just can't change, but the power and pride they feel in having their voices heard is worth the extra effort. High-level learning by students requires high-level planning and instruction by their teachers. A couple of years ago, there were a, a, a group of fourth graders whose teacher was pretty student-centered. The environment was one in which student voice was important. And this, this group of students wrote me letters to share their dissatisfaction with the current homework policy that we just worked a whole year on with um, some parents, teachers. I was part of that committee. And in reading their letters, I realized that basically after the fact, we didn't have a student on the committee. We didn't have a student voice. And I had totally missed an opportunity to include the student's voice in this process. And I was basically hearing about it after the fact from the students, and it was a huge oversight on my part. And I learned a huge lesson from it. Including student voice will help move students beyond basic knowledge and memorization and surface learning to more depth of knowledge, complex reasoning, because they're represented in the learning process. Students are in, who are invested, more engaged, more motivated to learn, and more responsible, responsible for their learning. So I'd like to leave you with this last story. It's a little bit longer, so I'm gonna talk quickly. In my third year as principal at King, I had an unexpected visit from Urbana Park District. And they were renovating King Park, which was kind of our little neighboring park area. And the kids, and there's some King folks in here will remember this, the kids kept pulling up the flowers. They'd plant the flower beds, the kids were going out there pulling them up. And so they came to me and said, principal, what are you gonna do about this? And I said, well, I mean, this is happening at night, on the weekends, you know, what do you really want me to do about it? But I took it to the staff, we talked about it. We had just finished talking uh, about Ruby Payne's work, the framework of poverty, and we realized as a staff, this really wasn't a behavior problem, it was a teaching problem. And what were we gonna do as teachers to really help teach our students how important plants and life and how important this is to our world. So we kind of took that on. A couple of them are in here today. And we had some areas in our building that needed a little outside, needed a little TLC. So we got grant money. We put our own money in. We begged and borrowed from all over the community. We got plants, rakes, hoses, and we really took the kids. They spent their recess time, lunch times, out there raking, planting flowers, watering flowers, weeding flowers, and guess what? King Park has never been more beautiful since then and, and currently. And it reminds me of, I was with um, a teacher on Friday. We have a new courtyard at King that was part of the renovation. It was just a grassy courtyard. Started off as mud, ended up as grass, and that was it. And it's turned into a really living, growing, outdoor learning environment for the kids there. It's really exciting. One of the teachers who had spearheaded this project was telling me about a few of her students and the experience that they'd had, planting, weeding, watering, mulching. And she told me about one student who saw a student watering 
this shrub and said, hey, you're not doing that right. And the teacher came over and said, it's okay. She was doing her job, you know, to keep the conflict at bay. And he said, no, I planted that. That is my shrub. That's my bush. And he needs to water it the right way. And I'm making sure we take care of Shrubby, the name he had given his bush. This is an example of student ownership, student responsibility, and student voice. This teacher and this student will always remember that shrub, and he will never forget Shrubby. I still have four more students that I think of from Champaign, Chicago, King School, that I have in my mind when I help make decisions at the district level for curriculum instruction assessment. I would encourage you, while you're here today and tomorrow, to really think about those students who have stayed with you, some of the students from the video, and keep them in your memory bank when you're making decisions and planning for the future of our youth. So thank you. I am so excited to be here uh, today and talking about a question that I know we're all interested in. How do we invite student ownership into our classes? So I taught high school English in Massachusetts and I've, been, I've moved here and I'm a doctoral student here at the College of Ed. So I've been doing a lot of thinking about my students and preparing for this. And I was actually home two weeks ago for graduation and it was wonderful. I like saw one of my students and he like run, he runs up to me and he says, Miss Cadet, I miss you. I miss your class. And I'm like, Matt, you just graduated high school. Like, you don't miss my class. And he said, no, he's like, I miss, we would start with the book, but we would talk about life. Like, I miss that. And I just, I love, I love this student, and I loved how much it captured for me, like, what I mean when I'm talking about student voice. I'm sorry. Yeah. There we go. I'm not quite as sorry. <laughs> That's okay. Um, so it really captured for me what I, like I said, what I mean when I talk about student ownership and student voice. And student ownership happens when we come together in our classrooms, around our content, around our grade level with our kids, but really that it matters to them in that time, in that moment, but that it has an impact on them and it matters to them afterwards as well. So that sounds great, that's big and wonderful and I hope we can all agree, but where do we start, right? And for me, I start with curriculum design. And I think about curriculum design as not only the content that we're teaching or the activity sequence that we're going through, but also the opportunities for students to make meaningful choices, right? The, the how we're building culture, how we're building a community, really the learning ecologies that are happening in this space together. And so if I'm thinking more broadly about what, like, what it could be, then I think about what are the elements that go into this, okay? So I've thought about my practice and I've thought about all the choices that we make as teachers. So I'm gonna talk about seven of those considerations, those curriculum design considerations. I'm gonna talk about them today. Then I'm gonna put them in the context of one unit. And like I said, I taught high school English and I wanna make sure that as I'm talking today that you are thinking about your own content area and your own grade level and your own practice because that's what really matters, right? And translating that into what, you're, uh, what matters to you and to your students. I then want to make an argument for the year as a whole and saying that the perspective of the year when we're talking about uh, responsibility, responsibility and maturity and ownership and growth, as much as we would like those to happen overnight, they don't, right? And so how does considering the year and these units that we're thinking about actually give us a perspective on fostering that long-term growth beyond our classrooms? And then I want to wrap up and give you a couple things to think about as we go off into the next two days of Chancellor's Academy. All right, so up on the screen I have the outline of this house. Um, it's gonna be a very intentional metaphor I'll work with. And I'm gonna be building this house with seven, seven elements, seven design considerations. Now, in, in your baggie, I mean, sorry, in your folders, eh, there should be a baggie that has, set, that has these tangrams, excellent. So I wanna invite you to build the house along with me. Uh, you, these are yours, feel free to like write on them, take notes around them. There we go. But, I'll give you a moment. It's like the kids. <laughs> All right. So this is going to be a very intentional metaphor that we're building together because I think when we're thinking about units and when we're thinking about our classroom, there are so many things that go into it, 
right? It's not just content. It's not just technology, right? And it's really, for me, how all these pieces fit together and how they interact with each other and the order in which I'm thinking about them, but really a dynamic house, if you will, that we're building. So the first one I want to talk about is content, right? This is where we usually start, right? It's what you're required to teach. It's what we have. Um, I had Macbeth and Lord of the Flies and Night, which is a <laughs> memoir about the Holocaust. And so, when I'm thinking about starting here, I also think about what else I bring into the class. Right? I think about the videos, and I think about song clips, I think about political cartoons and graphic novels, and really, what are these passes, right? what are these multiple passes at the core understanding that we're all engaging with? And if I'm thinking more broadly about content, that immediately provides an opportunity for students to bring in songs that they listen to and connections that they're making and all sorts of all sorts of supplementary texts that they can offer to our conversation. But sometimes when I'm thinking about curriculum, I also start with the product. I say, you know, today wait, we're going to be doing a research paper, right? Or this is a short story <coughs> unit. And it really helps me think about what is necessary for products in my classroom, right? It's an English classroom. It's important that disciplinarily students write an argumentative essay. But sometimes I think about the understanding of pulling together different resources, and I think about synthesizing them into a greater whole. And that makes me say, like, does it really need to be an essay? Or can I say, this is the important understanding, and how are you going to put that together into a CD compilation with reflection? Or how are you going to put that together into a piece of art? And then that way, broadening our also definition and our control over and the choices we're making about products in our classroom. Now, if I'm thinking about content and I'm thinking about product, immediately I now jump to, OK, but what is the everyday? What is the ongoing work? What is the writing and talking and speaking, the activities? What is inquiry in your classroom? And inquiry is one of those words that's thrown around a lot, right? Inquiry this and inquiry process. But for me, it's students asking questions that matter to them and then going about answering them. So if, I, if that's what inquiry is, then how am I as a teacher supporting that? What kind of choices and, and scaffolding am I giving to inquiry? And I think first about uh, student talk in my classroom, and I think second about the artifacts that students are creating that document their understanding. So if I think about student talk, we would do uh, a discussion format in my class called Ed Cafes. And I'll talk about Ed Cafes at a teacher share out later in more detail. But Ed Cafes were really like running a conference in the classroom. Right? The students would pick a topic, and then they would, they, would run the, they would run the sessions in each corner of the room, and other students would attend, and everybody would be taking notes. And usually these Ed Cafe like, uh, units would also incorporate uh, an essay. So my students would say, well, Ms. Kennett, can we like, run a discussion on what we're going to write our essay on? And I'm like, yes, absolutely. That sounds like, that sounds like good, ongoing like, use of your requirements. Because I'm still making choices as a teacher. I'm still saying you need to run for ad cafes and you still need to write an essay. But what you're doing in there, right, what that looks like is built on what you're interested in and how you are making that meaningful to yourself. So I also said that inquiry, I can support inquiry by the artifacts of the process. Especially in an English classroom, the writing process is important, like the writing process. And that looks like so many different things. You have to have some pre-writing, and you might have an outline. And this is what my outlines look like, and here are some models of other outlines. But what does an outline look to you, right? And how, can, how are students creating and drawing and graphing and charting and documenting all of their different passes at asking questions and trying to answer them and challenge them, right? What does that actually look like? And how are they creating those artifacts that they then can then compile and say, this is the process that I went through? And if we're being more flexible about what things can look like, if you will, what artifacts can look like, then I think about representation broadly. And representation for me, like if we talk about representation and product, if I said we are all going to write a research paper, we know what that looks like. It's going to be printed on paper, it'll, it'll be in paragraphs, hopefully it has quotes embedded. But no matter what the content is, it looks the same, right? But if I said, you know, we're all going to write a poem about the nature of power, you could do some beat poetry or found poetry. You could do a sonnet or a haiku. Right? Immediately, the opportunities within representation make available so many, other, so many other chances for students to make meaning for themselves. Or if I say, you know, it's important. We've been working with haikus. You would need to demonstrate that you understand what a haiku is, its form, and why we would use it. They could represent that in art, in a video, in some sort of like audio format. 
right? So what makes sense? How are they, how is now the onus on my students to think, to make design choices about what's going to help them construct meaning? And I think that all brings me now to thinking about audience, because they need to care about what they're doing, right? And I think that onus of it mattering makes me think about them as their first and primary audience, right? We all want to do work that matters to us. That is kind of one of those like root foundational beliefs, and yet we all have to do busy work. And so how do I make my class more about the, the most of my class, about them caring about what they're doing for themselves, and then also doing uh, the, like, the work that we need to do? For audience too, it's flexible. I think about in-class opportunities. I think about how, um, how, we're do how I'm structuring different discussion groups and activities and ways for them to talk to each other, especially as they're working through the inquiry. Uh, inquiry process. I also think about the school community, and I thought about it as Jennifer was talking multiple times. What are the authentic ways that we can have students speaking to those and like speaking to people in their in their community, um, and creating artifacts? And um, I sometimes we would do a foyer fair, so it was like a science fair, but it was like with English stuff, and it was in the foyer, so it became a foyer fair. Um, and they would all go out and they'd have their stuff up on the desk and the principal, the administration would walk by and guests of the school and they would ask, oh, what do you have here? And that is just a, an interesting and different audience for them explaining like what is it that we've been doing in English class. Now, when I think about audiences, um, when I think about audiences online, I don't think about like the internet as the audience. I think about it as a chance to say, how are we helping students join communities and have conversations with people that matter, to, like people in communities that matter to them, right? Because they have interests, and sometimes they might even already be writing online. They might have their own blogs. They might be writing fan fiction. They might be creating videos that they've posted. So how are we not only acknowledging that, but how are we making space for that to come in too? And that makes me think about technology in general, okay? And technology is often a place that I start. I was kind of, that was such an exciting place for me. I say, we have iPads for a week. Well, what are we going to do? Um, and so it can't stop and end with iPads for a week, though, right? Because we have so many other, other things going on that I need to acknowledge and work with and play with. I might think about iPads or the computer lab as devices, but I also can think about platforms, right? Uh, we have Google Apps for Education, or we might have Google Drive, um, and Google Drive is a place to do a digital portfolio for the entire year. So how am I thinking about that platform as an opportunity? I might also think about technologies as uh, social processes that help us accomplish goals, right? And in that sense, uh, the writing process as a technology. Because if I'm thinking about devices and platforms and processes more broadly, it really just helps me say, wait a minute, I can't, uh, yeah, I, I, it's like, wait a minute, like, what are, what are students bringing into this space? What are their own devices that they may have in their pockets that they might have access to? What are their own expert, what's their own, like, experiences on other platforms that they can bring in? Because I'm not going to be an expert on all of the technologies that I have, uh, that I have available to me. But as a teacher, I have an expertise with helping students uh, marshal and negotiate and think about the resources that they have available to them and how they're making meaning with them. And I think that brings me to thinking about metacognition in my classes, because I'm saying, students, how are you thinking about yourself as a learner? How are you thinking about your, your own learning and helping it? And this could sometimes be like, a, uh, like an exit slip at the end of the day. I would ask them, how does our graphic organizer help you think through the problem? How would you redesign it and why? Right? Or at the end of every unit, we would do a metacognitive letter. Um, and they would ask, uh, so they would write me a formal business letter, and we might write it on the due date, or we might go to the computer lab. But they would always talk about uh, their strengths. It said, what was it like in this product that you think is really strong, but also over the course of the process? What did you struggle with, um, again, in this project, and the, or like in this product and over the course? And also, tell me what else is going on. Uh, you can tell me a joke. I have some really, really great Shakespeare jokes because of these letters. But also, you know, we won our Shakespeare, we won our, um, won our Shakespeare game. We won our soccer game last night. We, you know, things are a little tough at home. But these letters as a way for me to value um, not only the product that they're, like, and for them to value too, not only the product that they just handed in, but all that went into it, right? What built up to it? What is the context in which I'm sitting down now to think about and to assess their work? And I think that is just such, a, that's, oh, that's important at the end of every unit. 
But then we would talk about at the end of the year, uh, they would do a, like a huge metacognitive letter, they would look back at all of their letters for the year, and they would say, consistently, I was strong at this, you know, I struggled and overcame this, and I'm still struggling with this. And in that way, they're thinking about leaving my classroom as learners, um, taking all of the experiences that they've had, and either going into junior year or going into and going off out of college, out of high school, out of college, right? out of high school. And what does that mean for them as as people collecting and thinking and writing and researching and so forth? Now, some of you might be saying, "What about assessment?" She has not talked about assessment yet. We're teachers; we assess all of the time. Right? It's the look on kids' faces, it's the ongoing formative assessment in the inquiry process, it's the summative assessments in the product, in the metacognitive letters. We might be really intentional about our assessment. Like I would do 100 points for the process and 100 points for the product. So if I said, if you don't engage in the process at all and you get an 80 on that product, then those of you who are really motivated by your grades are realizing that that's just a 40 average. Right? So there are ways that I can value the structures of our ongoing work through my assessment. But I do believe that, like I said, we're assessing all the time. It's all in here. Um, and that is just a, you know, a way that knits this entire, all of this together. So what does this look like in the course of one unit? I want to talk about the art of witnessing, which is a unit that I did uh, for all four years that I taught. And it evolved, and it became this, one of my favorite units to teach. And it started with Eli Wiesel's Night. Uh, which is a, an account of his, it's a memoir, an account of his uh, survival at Auschwitz. And when teaching the Holocaust, I would always have, um, I have all kinds of resources. I have uh, different poems and podcasts and stories and images that go into the Holocaust. So I know that this is going to be a unit that I'm well prepared. Okay? And I say to myself, when it comes to all of these, like the why of the Holocaust for me as a high school English teacher, it for me it really becomes, what does it mean to witness? What does that mean to witness somebody's text, to witness the atrocities that, that humans do unto others? And so I say, in that line, I'd like my product to be my students witnessing Eli Wiesel's text. Okay? So they're going to somehow use the words of his text, and they're going to create an image with those words. Okay? I'm pretty, pretty straightforward. But already I've realized I'm making a lot of choices. So what is it about their inquiry? What is it that makes them want to invest? What, makes, like, what is their in? And you can see here I've now used an orange triangle to, talk, to, to really show that like, they're making in, like, in deep choices in this, meaningful choices. And so I say, as we're reading through, um, I'm going to help you. I'm going to still staple this process. As we're reading through in every page, go ahead and choose out one word that is either on the page, like gallows, or a word that the page makes you think of, like power. And I want you to make this, this list of 100 words. And then I want you to choose what image you are creating with these words. Is it a bowl of soup? Is it a map of Germany? One student did a map of Germany, and then he used very particular words to surround the dots where he had shown the, where the concentration camps were, like eternity. I had one student who, she made this crematorium smokestack, and she had all these words that were close together about like hate and control at the very bottom. And as the smokestack rose, they, were, they started spreading out, and they were words of like freedom and faith and hope. And so in that sense, I was thinking about how like, they've picked this representation, but they've also chosen how, like, the tools that they're using to do so. Like, she had actually used an art program that she was very familiar with and used in other contexts. But a lot of students also used pen and paper and uh, just like black pen and the technologies that they were more comfortable with as they represented their image. And I know they were so intentional about what they were doing because they wrote, instead of a metacognitive letter for this unit, they wrote uh, artist statements. And so in these artist statements, they said, you know, this is how and why I'm witnessing Wiesel's text in this way. This is how I'm being intentional about constructing my representation of that. And we, would put, we put all of these at the end of the hallway. So that really, the school community became our audience, because as they walked by, they could stop and they could see the art and the artist statement right next to it and think about, OK, that in a way, the school community became our own, like the witness to our own work. Now, I said I was going to make an argument for the year, and I hope that that was helpful for thinking about one unit. But again, these one units are situated in their, in their three or four weeks, but why am I thinking about the year as a whole? And how am I thinking about the year as a whole? I would say that 
in the beginning of the year, back to that idea that this doesn't happen overnight, in the beginning of the year, I am making a lot of choices. Right? I'm saying I'm going to put short stories in front of you, and we're going to write short stories, and it's going to be a lot of pen and paper, but it's really important that I'm learning about you, and I'm learning about what questions you ask, and the connections you make, uh, your interests, your personalities, the ways that you make meaning of the world. Right? In a way, it helps focus that time and that learning for me and for them. A second unit, might, uh, I might pick the book and I might pick what they're creating, but I'm also opening up opportunities for their, again, their inquiry process, but maybe for them to bring in more technology. And I may be incorporating more Google Docs as I'm thinking about, we have this entire year where they're going to be collaboratively writing and they're going to be like, creating a digital portfolio. We get to kind of that mid-semester and I'm like, you know, I want much more discussion in the class and I want that discussion to drive what they're creating as products. And though we might be reading Frankenstein as a core text, really the unit like, is, like, rests on what they're bringing into the class. What are their songs, like I said, what are their other texts that they're bringing in? And what are they going to create as a product? So then I think about, you know, when we come back from, when we come back from winter break, everybody has new toys and they all want to talk about everything. So how am I making space for that? A question might be, um, why do we tell stories, right? And so it's kind of a Beowulf unit and kind of a speech unit and kind of a, kind of a, a poetry unit. And I say kind of because really I'm asking students to answer that question and they're using each of those as resources to figuring out what their answer is, memorizing it, and then standing up in front of us and telling us why they think it matters that we tell stories. And then standardized testing, the realities of all of our year, right? I'll pick back-to-back -back questions, back-to-back -back units that actually ask the same questions, right? Macbeth, um, especially Macbeth, right, before they go into the standardized testing, I can ask, is he the architect of his own destruction or is he the victim of circumstance and fate? And so then with our, all our scheduled disruptions, we, move, we still move into our research unit, where now they pick a behavior monster, um, Pol Pot and Ted Bunny and Michael Vick, and they, pick, uh, and they ask the same questions. Was this person the architect of their own destruction, or were they the victim of circumstances and things that were out of their control? And because I've done back-to-back -back units and I've said, you know, we're asking these same questions, I'm saying to them, I ask them, like, how was your inquiry process the same? What was different? What, like, tell me more about what you were learning over the course of these two units and why it matters to ask these questions. And so then as we're getting closer to the end of the year, I might be doing poetry unit with, like, April and uh, April being poetry month and saying, okay, I'm going to say we're doing a poetry portfolio but you pick all of the content that goes into it, and you pick the types of ways, the, the ways in which you're, you're reflecting on that and making meaning of it, so that whoever opens your poetry portfolio, while that might look the same, that they're going to get such different experiences in reading through it. And that, like if I think about, now we're getting to the end of the year, and I'm thinking about all of the opportunities, the designed ways in which I've made choices in my unit planning, in my curriculum, so that when we get to the end of the year, and I ask them some big, broad question like, what does it mean to be human? This is always my favorite at the end of the year. What does it mean to be human? Uh, they're not going to say opposable thumbs. I had, actually, I had actually said that, so I was like, I'm going to like, work in my sophomores is the question I'm asking. And the guy scoffed, and he's like, oh, they'll probably just say opposable thumbs. It's like, really? Really? They are so much cooler than that. They are, like, they are so much smarter and they're so much uh, more invested than to just say that. Right? They're going to pick an answer and they're going to pick a product that reflects that answer. Uh, like one student said, I think, telling, yeah, I think that telling stories is what makes us human. And so she created a story and then she ended up, to, yeah, she told it to us. And I think that when we look across, we can see that this, this uh, unit at the end of the year is able to be almost entirely student-driven and student-run and student-chosen because of all the experiences they've had over the course of the year. And you might say, well, that's well and good in your English class. You have so much flexibility with your units, but I have a curriculum I have, a, I have to teach. And I think that's completely a reality. But if even if every single one of these content triangles were blue, right, that you're choosing the curriculum that, like, in terms of the content, there's still so many opportunities for students to be making choices and to invite like, what they have and what they're interested in and why it matters to them into this year-long conversation. And so here we go at the end. Um, I hope that through talking about these, <laughs> hope talking about through these, uh, these elements, there's so many things that we do consider as teachers in thinking about our classrooms and our students, but these have been really fruitful for me to think about what I'm making choices about and how, like, how I'm making choices about them. What are my intentions there? 
in walking through one unit, I know that like that was it was a very specific uh, instance of my practice. But I think it was again, how am I thinking about flexibly these units? How are they playing together? How are they working um, to really invite students into the conversation about what the unit becomes? And then that argument for the course of the year, because I think really it's our perspective as teachers in thinking about how intentional uh, we are about our choices and what they build to that matters for me. So if you'd like more uh, examples of my practice, uh, I, have, I have a blog. Um, who doesn't, right? Uh, my, my students would just Google Katrina Kennett blog, which you're welcome to do, um, or it's uh, kennettenglish.blogspot.com. I feel like it was one of those things I needed to get a t-shirt of when I was teaching. And um, on the blog, there are a lot more specific examples. I will be around for the next two days. I would love to talk and learn more about your classrooms and how you think about this in your own practice. And I think as hopefully it provides a big, broad overview of ways that, of, like this, of this in a general sense so that you can really think about what it means in a very particular sense for you. So I think we all agree that student ownership matters. And it matters to us deeply as teachers. So the question that we're still keeping asking is how can we help students make it matter to them?